I love this passage because it's a passage that we can have our head in the clouds or our head in the stars or the sky. I love, I love having my head in the sky and space. One of the questions uh, that I wrestle with is when or where does earth end and heaven begin? How close is God to each one of us? How do we engage God in the realm of our daily lives in order to perceive a new reality, a reality that can transform what is broken in us and in our world? Can God actually be a part of that transformation? Is there a boundary between heaven and earth? Or are they separate? Or are they together? Or are we just not evolved enough to understand that heaven, or the realm of God, or the kingdom of God, as the New Testament scriptures say, exists here and now, like Jesus and John the Baptist says. How many of us have been lucky enough to catch a glimpse of the divine? A glimpse of heaven. Maybe it was a call experience of some kind, or maybe it was an encounter with somebody in an instant. You connected with something outside the realm of this The physicist Niles Bohr, in 1922, he won the Nobel Prize in Physics, and he's a Danish physicist. And Niles Bohr is the father of quantum physics, which quantum mechanics is a part of quantum physics, and I appreciate that Jim, you may know this name. Uh, but Niles Bohr once said that the first inkling that he had about the nature of the universe came when he was a child gazing into a fish pond at his family home. For hours on end, Niles Bohr would lie beside his pool watching the water and the ripples of water and the fish swimming in the water. And one day he realized that the fish that he was watching didn't know that they were being watched. The fish were unaware of any reality that was outside the pool. Sunlight streamed in upon the water from the outside, but to the fish, it was simply just an inner illumination of the world they swam in. Even when it rained, the fish saw this not as an event from the outside, but only as ripples and splashes in their own environment. Bohr wondered if humans were like fish in this regard, being acted on in multiple dimensions of reality, but aware of only our own limited frame of reference. In other words, are we bound by our own small, isolated world, unaware that a larger reality encompasses us. What if our worship every Sunday morning were a chance, were our chance to lay down beside life's pond and to realize that what often looks like just the mundane existence on any Monday morning, like events contained in Moore's Pond, are actually interventions from something, another world that exists at the same time. What if God is present and at work in every ripple and space of our life? Yeah, in rare moments, the glory of the divine breaks in. 
in upon human life, and it's as if time is suspended. There is a new consciousness that breaks forth. Transformation is what we call it, or a call to resurrection. And it results in this profound change within any individual or with any community of people. And we have a fancy word for it in theology, and we simply say, call. The Sunday before the season of Lent is called the Feast of Transfiguration. Jesus is seen by his disciples in the scriptures read every Sunday before Lent. Jesus is seen by his disciples in one dazzling vision. He's transfigured on a holy mountain, and it's in every, every gospel text and in the letter of 2 Peter. In today's lesson from the Gospel of Mark, shortly before Jesus begins his final journey, and it's this way in every, uh, every gospel text that talks about the transfiguration. It is Jesus' transition moment. It's his time of encounter with God, and then he descends the mountain and enters Jerusalem for his final days. And so we hear Jesus takes three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, that they were the key disciples in Jesus' midst. And he takes them up a mountain and they experience this divine encounter, this moment of glory. And mountains are always places of revelation in the Bible. So that's why Jesus goes up a mountain. It's a place of encounter with God. Mountains function that way in both Old and New Testaments. They are always places of revelation. And so on the mountain, Peter, James, and John momentarily see Jesus transformed. His form and his clothing are light, brilliant light. And Mark says, and he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white. And there appeared with Jesus and his disciples, Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Have you ever talked to any of the great figures of your past? Have you ever talked to a parent or a grandparent or a friend or sibling, spouse, whatever? Have you ever found yourself talking to someone and their presence is not there physically, but it is there and you know it's there and you feel that presence? Why Moses? Why Elijah? Well, they were the two greatest spirit people in Israel's history. And they both had these transformity or moments of glory. One of the texts uh, Dennis read to you about Elijah, and you know Moses. It was an expectation among first century Jewish people of which Jesus and his disciples were a part, that the great prophet Elijah would return at the end of the age. That Elijah would usher in this new age. And this hope is expressed during the crucifixion of Jesus, where people think that Jesus is actually crying out to the prophet Elijah, come, the new age is ushering in. Torah teaching found in Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 15 through 18 say that in the last days a prophet like Moses would appear. And Mark possibly wants his audience, his congregation to understand that through this story of transfiguration, Jesus is associated with these two great figures of Israel's history. The two greatest spirit people that Israel knew, Moses, Elijah. And so the transfiguration story is in every New Testament gospel text because 
It answers for the early church who Jesus is. Who Jesus is. Who is Jesus for you? Who is he? What role does Jesus play in your life? Even though all of us have been Christians probably from the time we were born and raised in the community. Who is Jesus for the disciples then and now? The Gospel writers Matthew, Mark, and Luke all portray Jesus as the spirit person through whom the power of God's spirit flows in every act and every encounter. And we've been reading about those encounters and those transformative times where Jesus met with people all through the season of Epiphany. Jesus' relationship to God's Spirit was the source and the energy for the mission that He undertook. Jesus was so deeply, deeply connected to God's Spirit, with the Spirit of God's consciousness. Jesus was one who knew the other world, like Moses and Elijah. And his disciples were so transformed on the mountaintop that day that they were willing to leave their former lives and follow Jesus into Jerusalem and all the way to the cross. So church, this season, or this Wednesday, we begin a new season of the church here. So we transition from epiphany, a time of light, a time of spirit, a time of, of understanding the identity of Jesus and what Jesus means to us. And we enter 40 days to wrestle, to wrestle, and 40 days to look with fresh eyes at who Jesus is. I believe that this season of 40 days called Lent will encourage us to go deeper in our faith and to renew our relationship with the church. Like Niles Bohr, sitting beside the pond and watching the ripples of water and the fish swimming below who are unaware of anything outside their own realm, we must be aware of another realm. That the light of God is all around us, deep in us. And our challenge, like Jesus' disciples, is to be present in the moment that is given to us. Always be present in the moment and know that God is with us transforming that moment into an experience of divine grace and encounter. So, as we journey through and out of the season of Epiphany, may we shine with the spirit of the light of Jesus, and may we spread the hope of resurrection. May we spread the hope of resurrection. faith that love is the most powerful force in people's lives and in a world that God so loves. We invite you to begin to uh, transition yourselves from this season into Lent. We want to end our time in this season with light. And so as we stand and sing our hymn of invitation, let us be filled with God's spirit and with God's light as we move into a time of inner reflection.